Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of Cartoons vs. COVID. I am, of course, your host, The Gruppeteer, and we are uh, back for the first episode of the continuation of Cartoons vs. Cancer, which is going to directly benefit members of the um, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in Manchester, New Hampshire, as well as those working on the front lines to fight the coronavirus pandemic currently going on. Please check the links in the description below for ways that you can donate and help and 100% of the revenue collected from this video will go towards first responders at the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center. My guest today, my inaugural guest for the program, is Chris Pern. You may know him from such works as the director of Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs 2 and the new Netflix uh, original film, The Willoughbys. Uh, Chris has worked on everything under the sun for studios like Ardman, uh, Sony, um, he's worked on pretty much everything I could think of, and he has a longer IMDb page than I have, <laughs> than anybody I've, I don't think I've talked to yet. So, uh, Chris, it's wonderful to have you on the show today. Thanks for uh, taking some time out to talk to me. Thanks. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be uh, in the inaugural new show for a good, sh good cause. It's great. Well, the, the first thing I have to ask, definitely, is what are you doing to stay sane during the quarantine? How are you passing the time? Um, well, I just went into another quarantine because I I was in Los Angeles up until Monday. So uh, down there, I was I was working a lot. Um, it was uh, it was uh, you know it, it's 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 not the same as being in a studio, but you know there's a lot of you know Zoom meetings and when you're in development, yeah. you know a lot of time alone is actually a good thing. So uh, so that's okay. And then was trying to go for runs and bike rides and you know uh, wherever things were open, you know in terms of what the what the city was allowing, uh, mm -hmm. trying to take advantage of that. But now I'm in an honest to God quarantine and I'm, uh, yeah. I'm in a house with windows and that's the only, that's the only light I get. <laughs> is it now, is it, true, days. is it true that you live on a goat farm up there? In uh, I grew up on a goat farm. I uh, currently I have a farm that has donkeys and a horse and some geese and chickens. So no goats, but no goats. Yeah. <laughs> Every, everything else that old McDonald's. Everything had. else. No everything else. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is there? Is there some sort of connection between um, growing up um, around livestock and wanting to work in animation? Um, I don't know. Is it? Do you, do you find this a commonality with people that you run into? I, Maybe. Uh, you yeah. never know. I mean, you never know. The pitchfork kind of looks a little bit if you squint like a drafting table. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely about something about the solitude, like living in, yeah. in, in a place that has a lot of space and very few neighbors. And, you know, uh, time is something that as a kid, I never really had to fight for. Mm. And there wasn't a lot of distractions. So, um, but I'm the only one that ended up in animation in my group. So I, uh, I think it's still an anomaly. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, because we were just talking about how I live in the mountains of New Hampshire. And yeah. there, there's, always, there's always this sort of need to, like, want to fill in the gaps with your mind. And, yeah. I, and you, know, the, you know, you see a bunch of mountains. What if there were giant dragons that lived under the mountains? Or what if there were big trolls or something or so on? Yeah. Uh, and, and you just want to, you know, it makes you want to be a creative individual in that regard. Yeah, I used to have elaborate imaginations as to what was living in our woods. And, you know, uh, <laughs> still do, actually. It's, it's funny, you know. I, I go down in, in, the, in the winter, I go down in the middle of the night to clear off the pond and skate because it's sort of pretty down there, especially yeah. in a full moon. But, you know, I'll still get freaked out when I get thinking of, uh, you know, witches or, you know, werewolves or that kind of stuff. But, you know, so too many movies. Whole, <laughs> no such thing. So this yeah. whole pandemic thing is really, has really got me thinking um, because I, I do go to school for animation, as we were talking about. And yeah. uh, those listening, SCAD class of 2023. Um, and <laughs> those, uh, those who are, you know, maybe live in rural areas who know that they have to go off and live in Los Angeles if they want to work in the animation industry. Do you feel that this pandemic, if it's revealed anything, has shown that maybe you could, you could feasibly live anywhere and still contribute to, you know, larger animated projects? Yeah, I mean, it, that, that's been coming. So, I mean, I think uh, in a lot of ways, the pandemic has exposed realities to the world that's shifting um i found for my career like around 2013 um that was when i i first left sony and bought the farm in canada that i was able to do that and i was able to do it relatively successfully i think the reason i went back into the studios was that i kind of miss people um yeah. but the, the 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 infrastructure and the desire to work with the best talent around the world wherever they are has been around for for a considerable period of time. And so all that infrastructure has been very valuable in allowing us to keep going. 
as um, as the pandemic made it impossible to you know kind of be together in a studio. So uh, I don't think that genie is going back in the bottle. Um, I know, I know, I'm, I like. I think for me, the thing I miss and the thing that's hard to sort of put a finger on is how do you kind of get to those ambient connections, like those, yeah. especially in story. It's like the stuff that happens in the hallway between meetings, or like that idea of like just sort of chewing on something, and then I don't know, just somebody you run into somebody in the in the break room, or you go get a coffee, and you just hear dialogue with like the people talking around you. It's that's where a lot of the story stuff sometimes on snaps, and, I, and I'm finding it's a little harder to sort of quantify what that is that's missing now. Um, but there's definitely something that feels a little bit, a little bit less than a little, but a little maybe, less than, yeah. But, but then maybe people adapt and maybe it's just like we find other ways to do it. Um, it's just the thing with the Zoom thing is you have to organize it. Like you can't, I, I don't just run into friends anymore. I have to sort of plan for that. So mm. it, uh, it just, it's a little bit more premeditated in the way I, I normally like to work. So um, I, I would love to get into the, the outstanding uh, path that your career has taken, um, you know, to, to becoming the director of two incredibly successful animated films. Um, the Netflix just released the numbers the other day of the Willoughby's is absolutely killing it. But to get back to the absolute basics, yeah. you are at the end of the day, a outstanding storyboarder. And my question is for those listening who might be, you know, learning how to make storyboards and so on and so forth, where do the best or where do most storyboards go wrong? Um, I mean, it's, you, you know, in arts, there's, there's, you know, there's rules and there's, yeah. There's rules that you break for the right reasons. Um, it's it's sort of, that's a little bit of a how long is a piece of string. I honestly think the hardest thing to wrap your head around as a story artist is the disposability of the job. And that it's actually, like if you pivot what it what it is, it's not illustrating, it's more like improv. And it's more like that sort of yes and room where you're throwing spaghetti on the wall to see what sticks. And while we all want to achieve, we all want to be right about our ideas. And, you know, as an artist, you kind of, I, I used to come up and, you know, cover my drawing and make sure that it was perfect before I'd show anybody. But the reality is drawings are never perfect. Ideas are never perfect. And the job of a story artist is to, you know, kind of step on the landmines and pop the pins of like the, the, the traps and try to like solve the story mm. from that very vulnerable place of at most of the time being wrong. And so it, it just like, uh, you know, there's that adage like writing and rewriting, it's the same thing. So a story artist is, is essentially a writer who's working with drawings mm. and the real final product comes in the edit of those ideas as opposed to the initiation of those ideas. So um, yeah, I think honestly, it's like to say pretty drawings don't matter, they do because it's all about communicating, but the amount of time you spend on a drawing versus what it's sort of giving you as an idea, that's the thing that I think years of experience has sort of, I think, you know, taught me is to not yeah. sit on a drawing too long, not sit on an idea too long, not to get too precious. And it, when possible, like divorce, divorce the ego from, from the conversation and try to really debate and argue and talk about the story for the story, not for what you've put on the wall. Hmm. And I, I do find it interesting that you bring up this, this idea of at once being afraid of your drawings and now being a lot more loose with it. Um, you did this outstanding TED talk uh, called the, Op uh, the Optimistic Opportunities of Failure. <laughs> the link is in the description. Um, and, it, and it goes over how you, can, um, how you have grown uh, as, a, as an artist and as a person to slowly accept how to use failure in a positive way. Now, this is an incredibly, incredibly important message. My question to you is, have you got better at catching baseballs since the <laughs> <laughs> publishing? Probably, not really, no, no. I mean, uh, I've been playing tennis. Uh, oh, yeah? That's one of the pan pandemic things. I'm getting better at that. <laughs> but uh, I'm actually blind in one eye, so I, I, I don't have really? depth perception. So I think that's the thing that really – I'm never going to get past that because it's like if you can kind of get used to the spatial distances, uh, you know, I'm okay. But, you know, baseball, it's changing all the time. So it's – that's yeah. fair. One of those, know, one of those itches. <laughs> I'm very bad at ultimate frisbee. All my friends play ultimate frisbee. I can't. I can't catch frisbees. It's just. It's yeah. too much. It's too much work. <laughs> um, and the you know so the the point of this TED talk it is out, it is outstanding is how you have used your the sort of negative channels or the negative channels that you were sort of um, grew up with and use them as positive outlets for your creativity. And you have this idea that you talk about. It's the philosophy that you live by about this idea of great practical optimism and 
this and this TED talk is, is from many years ago, but is this something that you find yourself implementing in the construction of films like the Willoughby's? Um, yeah. And I think, you know, there's a hypocrisy in, in, in saying that, you know, I, I live by these adages because it's hard to hang on to them. So sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, it takes moments of self-awareness to step back and, and realize that your, um, you know, your, your emotions are winning as opposed to sort of uh, allowing, you know, that, that sort of hope to, to sort of push forward. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, honestly, I, I, I don't like failing. I don't think anybody likes failing, but I think the, the, the way that we got the Willoughby's made, because it was a very quick production, was I had to show it a lot. And, 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 and showing it a lot, I failed a lot. And in failing a lot, I learned a lot. And in learning a lot, the movie got better. And the movie isn't perfect, no movie is. But one, one of the things that I always look at sort of the screening process and the pitching process, it's, it's less to sort of validate whether I'm right or wrong. It's more about asking an audience, am I saying what I think I'm saying? And are you hearing what I want you to hear? Um, one of the big sort of turnabouts for us on the Willoughby's was we had a screening in November of 20, I guess it was 2018. And it was our first external screening in LA. And the response from the audience was that the movie was feeling mean and, mm-hmm. and mean in a way I didn't want it to feel mean. I always wanted it to feel funny. And we, we, we weren't shying away from like some dark subject matter, but I never wanted it to feel like a mean film. And so I needed to hear that from an audience because I, I didn't think I was saying that. And so that allowed me then the opportunity to troubleshoot and go back in and, and revise. Um, after 20, 20 some odd years in this business, I don't think I've ever won anything by getting mad or by being defensive or by like all those dark things that you read about in self-help books and stuff. There's a truth to it. And I think when you're open and when you're straight and when you try to be you know, accepting of your limitations, then you can lean on other people to help you make a better thing. And at the end of the day, that's all we're doing trying yeah. to make something to entertain an audience and i think um i think that does translate around in life you know because uh, no i, I definitely understand what yeah. you mean but i would yeah. say don't sell yourself too short on the willoughby's not being <laughs> perfect because it does have ricky gervais as a cat licking its bollocks and i mean it's it pretty, yes. <laughs> pretty close like i have a book in per- in perfection and that's that's in there that's in there <laughs> for the later chapters uh, i mean i do think um i do think uh you know uh trying to say something in a film and animation is such a, you know, it, it's an expensive medium and yeah. we're always trying to appeal to the biggest audience that, that we can. But ultimately, like I've been lucky in my career to work on films that took risks and were, mm. you know, able to, um, you know, challenge what the conventions are. So I think Willoughby's did that in, in a few ways, but definitely in yeah. the uh, cat genital cleaning. <laughs> Mostly, uh, we, we yeah. Get, we get that one, yeah. <laughs> And, you have and to stick around for that, though. I think a lot of people might miss that. Miss that game. It's right that is the end. best post-credit scene, including every Marvel movie. That is the best post-credit <laughs> scene potentially ever. Um, and I'm glad that you mentioned um, how how you've slowly grown into you know being the director of the Willoughby's. But let's take it way back. Uh, you graduated from Sheridan College, and you mm-hmm. started working at Fox in the early days, right? Yep, yep. I was very lucky to come into animation at a time when um, people were still drawing on paper and there was there was that, you know, culture of mentorship, which is still there, but it's 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 way different when you have to first learn how to draw before you can learn how to act. You know what I mean? Like I think yeah. I think um, you know, just that that hierarchy of uh, you know, directing animator through assistance through rough in betweeners was a really it was a really great place to start a career in this in this communal industry. Yeah. Um, but, and yeah. Do you find that a lot of the advice you got from in-betweeners or timers or so on and so forth, a lot of the more uh, analog system of animation is, is maybe lost on the newer recruits in the animation field? Or do you feel like you can sort of tweak it to uh, apply to them? Um, I mean, I, 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 I think it's different. So I don't want to, you know, sound like one of those old guys with a stick on a porch going, you know, in my day. Um, I think the... I think the way people learn is faster. I think, you know, with the computer, you get a very, um, you know, almost, it's almost like puppetry um, in terms of like, the, you, you don't have to sort of learn how to build the architecture of the character from the inside out because it comes to you from, you know, the models and the riggers. But having said all that, you still have to know how to pose and you still have to know how to, you know, um, phrase the characters and what's appealing and all of the things that makes a drawing appealing makes a CG pose appealing. So I do think that, you know, when you look at artists that have those base drawing skills, 
they, um, you know, they still use it. They still, they still apply it into the work. Um, it's, it's sort of interesting because I, I went to school with a few people and then I taught at Sheridan and you, there are amazing animators that struggle with drawing and struggle with 3d, you know, shape language and, and managing that sort of 3d space. And the second you put them on a computer with a, with a rig and a model, they're amazing. So I'm not saying that, you know, it was, it was better back then because the truth was it was hard to find 20 people, almost impossible to find 20 people that could draw, rotate the characters, let alone act with them. So I think the quality of animation has actually come up quite significantly over the years. Um, I do think the thing that is like uh, quite a bit different is just, there's not that same ladder of mentorship. It, mm. it, there is, but it's not as structured as it used to be. And I think working with young people, um, they have that same learning curve. It's just, it just happens in different ways. You know? um, so when you, when you were going up that uh, aforementioned ladder, who were some of the people who, um, you know, some of the giants that you stood on the backs on to, uh, to learn what, uh, and get where you are today? Well, I mean, at, 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 Fox, there was Len Simon, who was the directing animator. Certainly Don was there, Don Bluth. And, and mm -hmm. he, watching him draw, was like watching a fish swim in water. Like uh, just his confidence was, was incredible. Um, Gary Golden was always very kind to me. Um, and then there was, there was you know, uh, a number of, of directing animators, uh, you know, uh, Renato, um, I, can't, I can never pronounce his last name. I think he's at Disney now. Uh, uh, Troy Salib, uh, who was at Sony for years, uh, all those guys were very kind and and hard on 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 us as we were coming up as in betweeners, but but hard in the right way, like hard in a way that that, that they taught us how to how to do the job. Um, and then there was a gentleman named Chris Shouten, who's currently um, uh, a friend of mine. He's Canadian. I met him in Arizona, but he taught me how to storyboard. And he really taught me just you know how to think through the drawings, how you know uh, the frame is not again it's not an illustration it's a camera and you always have to know where your ground is and you always have to know where your characters are standing and really anchor in sort of like how you're moving that camera so that way your 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 logic makes sense in terms of the continuity of, of, of a scene so uh, he was he was huge um and then you know i've been so lucky in my career like when i went on to sony to work with stuff like so many amazing directors jill colton was was awesome tony stock he directed box trolls he was tremendous roger allers you know lion king he he was he taught me so much uh, uh chris buck ash brannon and then of course chris and phil i was with them for years on the cloudy franchise and um i don't know i think having good parents is is, is a real blessing and i'm grateful mm -hmm. for for that because i feel like i've had a lot of good parents in this business to come and up. and um you bring up you bring up chris and phil of course uh, Chris Miller and Phil Lloyd for those, yeah. for those at home listening. Um, and when, when you find yourself in a situation like, like, you know, the, the director and their muse, everybody knows if it's a divine movie, John Waters is the guy who directed it. If it's a, uh, you know, if it's a Ryan Gosling movie, then probably Damien Chazelle isn't too far behind. But when it comes to animation, um, seldom do I, do I talk to people on the show who really have their sort of their person, you know, their, yeah. their figure, their studio, so on and so forth. But what I find so interesting about your career is, you know, you've continually worked with Will Forte. Uh, you've continually worked with um, Ardman on stuff like Arthur Christmas and the Pirates of mm -hmm. Misfits. Do you find it in animation that the situation isn't much different than live action when it comes to this sort of, this sort of courtship with a studio? It's just not highlighted as much in the media? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's, uh, there's still like that vestigial kind of studio, like kind of, studio structure and animation because mm -hmm. of how you know long it takes to make these things and how big the productions are where especially in story you tend to get hired and you stay with your your group um you know uh, a lot of my friends who went to disney are still at disney a lot of my friends who went to sony are still at sony same with dreamworks and so you tend to work with a lot of the same people depending on that culture um i'd say disney and pixar is a little more insular than other studios so being at sony like my overlap with dreamworks and and some of those studios was it was a bit more fluid but um you know it takes years to make these things and uh if i can be really blunt i mean if you're not a dick and people like working with you you tend to you tend to work with the people who you like to work with so yeah. um you know it's uh it is really one of those things where it's like finding that casting and i and i do think like it's important to to shake it up and work with different people and have different experiences and learn how to communicate in different rooms um and get different ideas but like i think every time you you walk away from experience with a good feeling you know that opens a door to another opportunity to to 
to collaborate with those people again. And I, and I, and I do look at a, at a career as being a short thing that happens in a small town. We, we all work together and it's just, uh, it's important, I think, to, to be mindful of that. So when, yeah. when a studio like Ardman, who you, you know, you've worked with plenty of times, when, yeah. they, uh, when they have a production or something, do people like you who have continually worked on it, are they maybe the first people that they send a, an email to? Or does, I don't know, Nick Park, for example, say, I want Chris on the team or something? <laughs> uh, I don't think so. I think sometimes yeah. it, it's timing. Like it's, it's sort of right place, right time. Um, uh, certainly, I think, um, you know, uh, like on the Shaun the Sheep movie, it was a situation where they'd gone through uh, a number of years on production. And, you know, you hit a point where it's like, it's helpful to have cold eyes on something. So mm. I came in and was helping Mark and Golly kind of in that last push of the, of, of the film, um, which was just, uh, I had bandwidth and, you know, um, they were, they were needing, you know, just that, that, that person. So being able to be familiar with them allows those opportunities to happen. And, and on Willoughby's, we certainly did that too. I mean, there's, there's, there was, you know, one of my good friends, Bob Fisher, who's a, an amazing editor, he edited the Spider-Verse. He came up in the last you know few months of production to sit with myself and Fiona who's, who's the lead editor to just you know help freshen the movie just get those cold eyes in, in the space and so um, quite often as a story artist I, I can be that for some of these productions because I, mm -hmm. I, I'm familiar with them but uh, yeah, it depends and there's so many different jobs I mean sometimes storyboarding is about lifting a movie sometimes it's about revising a movie sometimes it's about troubleshooting you know how do we make this better so there's there's so many different aspects to the job so it's, it's never one thing and as a board artist as someone who's worked in like you said traditional um cgi and stop motion do yeah. you find that you have to somewhat adapt your style to each medium or is it pretty uh baseline yeah it it, it, it adjusts to the movie so yeah. and and sometimes that's like caught like what came first the chicken or the egg so um for example willoughby's uh we start off with a budget that was like 25 million, it, it, it grew to 40 million, but still 40 million is a long ways from a 70 to $100 million yeah. movie, which is what Sony does. So how did we get 40 million to look like $100 million? Well, we had to make some choices. So the idea of locking camera, the idea of using cuts as opposed to moves, that lowers render times. And so then yeah. that takes us to, you know, a philosophy of storytelling. So um, I don't know if you picked up on this, but half of the movie is a sitcom. And in a sitcom, you shoot with three cameras and you really try to, you know, reuse your setups and, and long takes. And, you know, I was watching a lot of Peter Sellers movies. I was watching uh, Harold and Maude is a huge influence because really that movie isn't about sound or camera. It's about acting. And so it's like letting the just letting the camera be simple, save us money. And that allowed Kyle McQueen, my production designer, to make every shot pretty because, you know, we could we could put our time and energy there as opposed to trying to create a dynamic camera. But Surf's Up, that's a documentary. And so it's a completely different approach. And so the way you would storyboard for a, a mockumentary that's supposed to be like a Chris Guest movie is, is you know, you got to be looser and you got to be more open to, you know, a yada, yada, yada in your camera. So in, weird, in a weird way, camera becomes less important in storyboarding. It's more about character. And then trusting that when James Williams, who was our camera lead and that, would pick it up, he would do what he needed to do to make it work. So it felt improvised. So really all we're trying to do is hit marks. So it's, it's a bit more like a rehearsal as opposed to the Willoughby's, which was a bit more like math. This is the shot in the storyboarding. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all good. I have a flow chart so find, in the link. I find <laughs> I, I run out of breath yet. and then I realize, oh, I'm ranting. I'm going to <laughs> no, it's a to, try. That's uh, good. just talking at people. <laughs> I, 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 unfortunately, I can understand all of that. That's how, that's okay, how messed good. up my brain is too. <laughs> so don't worry. I know. Um, and and what, I'm, what I'm very interested about is, we can get into your uh, directorial stuff now, is... Um, the Cloud of the Chance Meatballs, the, the first one, you weren't the director, but you did um, a, a large chunk of, uh, of work for it. I always had a story for uh, about five years in that, yeah. which, is, which is a pretty long production for yeah. a story artist. Yeah. And, and you moved from, you know, you moved from a, a very important position to arguably the, more, the most um, important position as director for the sequel. But seeing as you were head of story on one and director for the second, did it did it seem difficult to, to move and take this um, original short story and bring it into two you know uh, feature length films? Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's that thing that happens I think in, in many careers like when you when you take that step into the next job, 
um, there's your impression of the reality of the, uh, the, the impression of the job and then the reality of the job. And those two mm. things are often different. And, and quite often, no matter how many times people will tell you it's different until you experience it, you don't know. So usually it leads to therapy and like, you know, hours of self-examination <laughs> and, 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 you know, whatever, whatever that therapy is, whether it's drinking or literally sitting on a couch talking to somebody, you have to find your way through that growing pain. Um, you know, and, and thinking about, you know, the experience, like when I went from being a story artist to being a head of story, that was probably the first time in my career where I had to figure out how to deal with like the managing of people and the managing of people, how to serve the movie. So like there's that, there's that sort of moment where you go from being the person who's shouting uphill, you know, ideas to being the person like a little higher on the hill, grabbing those ideas and taking them into edit. And then there's a practicality to what you need from the other side. And so trying to figure out how to be both the what if guy, sorry, and, and the <laughs> practical guy, um, those, those, that, that gap was something I had to learn. And then going into being a director, my job was, was often about protecting the movie and being open to ideas. I didn't realize mm -hmm. how much listening was involved as a director. Cause you know, we've all grown up seeing, you know, IFC documentaries about like the eccentric director who flips the table and, you know, um, you know, uh, tortures Shelley Duvall and makes her yeah. do things that, you know, but you can't do that in animation. You got yeah. 250 people and you're with them for like four years. So if you're, if you're, if you're flipping tables and stuff, you better be right. Um, and nine out of 10 times you're not. So I think a big part of the process is listening and trying to stay open to like trying to figure out a way to protect the, the integrity of what you're trying to say, but also be receptive to new ideas. Uh, the, actually the best metaphor I have is like, it's like riding a horse. Cause it's like when you're on the back of a horse, you got 2000 pounds of an animal with a brain underneath you, but you have, so you have to convince the horse that you know what you're doing, but you also have to listen to the horse that, that they know what they're doing because they have their feet underneath you. So it, there's a humility that you have to come into the job with. And you also have to have respect for the, for the process that I think is, is important. And it's like you were saying before about walking away from a job and saying, you know, wiping your hands and said, I did a good job on that. If you get the reputation as a director of, like you said, you know, throwing your beret across the room and ripping out your mustache, then it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be any luck, would it? Yeah. Um, I think I'm not, I'm not saying that's not, you can get results that way. I think, okay. uh, you know, people have had results that way. I, yeah, I think, and I mean, and I think you ha everybody has to find their own way in to, to the process. But I do think like when you're sitting on a hundred million dollars, and this is the thing about like doing the sequel to the first cloudy, it was a cult film that mm -hmm. was probably the best thing I'd worked on in my career, uh, arguably. And I love the franchise. Like I, or I sound so corporate when I said, I love the characters, genuinely love the characters. And we spent years fighting for those characters and years fighting for that movie. And originally I didn't want to do a sequel in, in the art. I didn't, I didn't want to do a sequel. I just didn't think I was the guy to direct it. And then it was sort of sitting in the room with Chris and Phil and Cody Cameron and we were just talking about the what if of the movie and the idea of doing a monster movie as opposed to a disaster movie felt fun. And then when it became not fun, there was enough investment, enough love and enough heart in those, in those meetings that sort of made it about something else. It was worth trying to, to figure out that story. Um, it's always hard being on the coattails of geniuses too. And I think like being, being there under the mentorship of Chris and Phil uh, was great learning, but also it's intimidating because those guys are always so good. So, you know, I think all of those things you have to weigh out when you start a project, you know, how that's going to, how you're going to survive that. Hmm. Um, and when it comes to... Yeah, uh, but yelling like, for me never works. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's the headline. <laughs> me, me neither. It usually doesn't help to get guests on the show when I have to scream at them. Um, I'm sorry I screamed at you that one time. <laughs> um, so oh, when, it's okay, but I needed it. It helped. It helped me. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, I slapped him and I threw the water on his face for those who can't see at home. Um, and so when it when it comes <laughs> down to a film like uh, Cloudy or a film like The Willoughby's, which are is not based on a on a large series of books, which is not based on a thousand page novel, they're based on generally short stories for children. Do you find it difficult to adapt them for feature length films? Do you find it difficult to take the story and bring it to a, a place where it can be much longer and much more accessible? You, you know, um, sorry, I'm just moving some, maybe my internet is a little better. I think, um, I actually think sometimes less is more. And um, mm -hmm. I think with, with, uh, with the Willoughby's, like there was a really strong theme and there was this really like kind of 
strong idea at the nut of the story, which was, you know, um, what's it mean to be a family? And, and, you know, what happens if, you know, a, a normal family with like two parents and four kids, what if the four kids thought their lives would be better as orphans? And what kind of tropes would sort of fall out of that story? And this idea of like, you know, you can't, you can't stop evolution and, and ultimately, you know, we're born into a family, but as we grow up, we choose who we, we kind of choose who we love. And mm -hmm. often it is your family and it should be your family, but if it's a tough family or if you're in a bad situation, it doesn't mean that you you have to live a life without, without kindness or without love. And so that's the hopeful nut of the movie. And that was there in the book. And so the idea that we had a really strong kind of, kind of like, like pit in the middle of, of, of what that film could be meant that we could then be creative about how we illustrated it and how we applied our, 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 our take on that, on that story. And I, I'd say the same thing with Cloudy. I mean, uh, you know, I remember very early days, Miller and Lord, they wanted to do a, a disaster movie for kids. And so the, 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 and, and they had a food sub, you know, kind of sub theme and the idea that bigger is not always better. And it's really a story about overconsumption at a time when, you know, Americans were eating a lot of uh, McDonald's and there was like a lot of stuff kind of being talked about with the obesity crisis. Yeah. So at the time it sort of felt timely. Interestingly enough, like cloudy too, for me as a, as a kid growing up on a farm, that whole conversation of who owns food was mm -hmm. really compelling. And, and so I think, Again, we don't want to be political and it's not about making a statement in a film that is like trying to change people's minds in one way or the other. It's just, what are you talking about? And what, like, what, what are, is there anything in there that feels chewy that can be, you know, mythologized or metaphored or, mm. you know, yeah, I know the excitement to wake up in the morning. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> You're a lot better with adjectives than I am. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I, have to, I have to ask another question about uh, working on Cloudy 2 because I work at a pizza place uh, and ah. I, can't, I can't look at pizza anymore. I can't eat pizza. It's just, <laughs> just, it's just awful to me at this point. It does working um, on a film where you have to animate food so closely, where you have to get every little movement and every you know, little way it reflects right, just perfect. Does it make you, uh, does it make you lose your <laughs> appetite for any certain food? Um, I, not really, because it's, it doesn't look like food for so long in the process. Oh, it, you know, it's just drawings or it's like digital versions of things, but it's like, yeah, weirdly enough, actually, I actually think it, because the one rule in Cloudy was the food always had to be delicious. Like I always had to look like advertising food. Mm -hmm. So, um, I got pretty fat. I mean, got fat for a couple of reasons. One, one, like the food will always look good. So we were always hungry, but plus, you know, when you're directing a movie, you're like a domesticated animal where like <laughs> you're literally shuttled from one meeting to the next. They tell you when to eat, when, when to go home, like the whole thing is scheduled up the wazoo. So um, you're just sitting on couches grazing while things happen around you. So that's brilliant. Like, yeah. And, and <laughs> I wish I lost my appetite. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's fair enough. Well, you can come to my pizza place. I will yeah, not there you go. It. I will not name but it. But I think, with, I think with, job. A, with a pizza place, you probably get the added thing of smell, and you're working with all the ingredients, right? So you're seeing, you're seeing. I guess the, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Well, I'm I'm the sort of like the delivery guy, right? And they, there's always that thing about like I bet the delivery guy sneaks French fries out of my out of my food or whatever when I'm when I'm when he's driving. It's just it's you don't want it. Doesn't it. happen. Yeah. Your car <laughs> just smells like onion rings all the time, and people get in and they get mad. <laughs> Doesn't I know when, like when, when we uh, when we uh, when we process our chickens on the farm, um, you know, it's a, usually it's a few days before I'll eat I'll eat meat just because yeah. I'm not <laughs> thinking about it, which is good. And I think everybody should know where food comes from. So. <laughs> um, pizza pizza but, delivery guys, that's where it comes from. Yeah. <laughs> pizza delivery guys, that's where it comes yeah. from. We make it in the car, actually. Fun fact. <laughs> um, so you you bring up the theme of family for the Willoughby's, and it is such an important theme in the movie. Um, and you, um, and I, I didn't stalk you, it was in your TED talk. You are uh, raising, you are raising, uh, little girls. Um, yeah, does, they're not little anymore. They're, they're, they're um, fully grown. Does, does the, oh yeah, like, it was a long time ago that you did that talk. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do, do the, um, do the, the, uh, the, the themes of parenthood that you may have found, um, arise in your life at all contribute to the way that you perceive the characters in the movie? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think uh, as a parent, to as a parent who loves comedy, like, there are moments where, you know, it would be really easy to just put the kid to bed and leave. 
and just go have a great time. And you can't because you just can't. Yeah. Um, you know, there's that voice in the head that stops you from, you know, uh, from from doing the unthinkable or for most people. And and I don't mean to make light of it when it when it does happen. But like, I do think um, that reality of like, it, mom and dad are in this love story that is interrupted by children is pretty, that felt fun to me mm-hmm. um, as, as a parent. And so um, ultimately, I think the the, the kid angle and this idea of like the independence of, of, of strong-minded children that I definitely got from my own girls and they've, they've had a weird life growing up in, you know, the wilds of animation. They moved around a lot. Like where I was a kid, I never moved anywhere. They were all over the world following my career and um, have friends scattered all over the world. And one of the things I just see from them is this confidence and this sort of non-linear uh, thinking that is, is really, I think, uh, valuable and, and inspiring and I'm inspired by a lot of young people that I've met just you know being lucky enough to be in this business and just being lucky enough to communicate to our audience and it's just I think this idea of like you know children having the opportunity to make bad decisions and then make the right decision to undo what they've done is really fun and really compelling and I think you know it's sort of a, um, a fun thing to play with this sort of uh, you know idea of like you know the anti-helicoptering uh, approach to, to child rearing whereas yeah. you know you let them do that those 10 dangerous things and figure it out for themselves but you know of course it's uh it's really you know it's a comedy so I'm, I'm i'm riffing on it i don't ever want to you know sort of say that any of these values are, are, are right but to me it's like having empathy for those characters is really important yeah. I, I definitely understand what you mean um and yeah. whenever i whenever i talk to people on the show about maybe maybe guests that they had that they were very nervous to talk to, or maybe they were starstruck whenever they got to have this person on the project. Um, you had it, uh, you had it very lucky that um, the, the outstanding person whose name I hope I pronounce right, Alessia Cara. Yeah, Alessia Cara. Yes, yes. <laughs> I wrote it down phonetically on my sheet. Yes. Um, I, you, you, you did have her work on your project with you, and I'm sure that was, that was wonderful for you, but what did your teenage daughters think about having international pop star Alessia Carr working with her father um to be honest with you that one uh, no offense to Alessia because she, she's amazing um my kids weren't into her um they're <laughs> they're they're more into uh they're kind of more ACDC and um you know uh uh they're in this they kind of just Ronnie DeFranco punk rock that kind of stuff so but they're also they're also 20 and 17 so I mean it's a different it's a different era. The one that got them was actually Neil Patrick Harris, who was the voice of Steve. Oh, yeah. So uh, that was pretty cool. Like uh, we were, uh, they used to, I used to I picked them up from school and I was like, I got to run one more errand. And they were like, oh, dad, it's so, like, so they always hate it when I go in the studio because I say, I'll be 10 minutes. I'm a liar. I'll be there for like two hours. And they, they were doing their homework and stuff. But I was there to introduce the movie to Neil Patrick Harris and his husband and, and their kids. And so uh, I take them into Sony and then uh, the elevator doors open and there's, and there's, Barney from uh, from um, How I Met Your Mother, and, and just their faces drop, and it was like <gasps> like that, and then you know they they got to hug him and all that stuff. So that was cool. That's about that's about like uh, the extent of the starstruckness that I've been a cool dad for a second. <laughs> well, I think I think I've dug myself in a hole here because I am. I am a teenage boy and I was starstruck to see Alessia Cara in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she's amazing. She's, a, and, and, and not only is she like an incredible singer and I really respect what she does and she writes all of her own stuff but mm. my god is she funny and she just has great comedy timing and she's really really good at just sort of riffing and sort of picking up stuff because like you know forte is a master of, of just like improvising coming up with like funny tangents and she could keep up with him in a way like not that they were ever in the same room but just in terms of her tone and her ability to sort of just spitball and pick up stuff mm. it was great yeah. they're, they're all i mean the whole the whole cast is fantastic we could uh, go on about it for hours but um yeah. what one thing that i watching the willoughby's and watching clyde with the chance meatballs too was so uh, was so in love with is the in- intense stylization of the animation mm-hmm. um and you've talked about this extensively i don't want uh to make you sound like a broken record at all <laughs> but, when, but when people uh when people complain or when people say you know all oh, animation looks stiff when it comes to when it comes to stuff like the new Lion King, when it comes to stuff like maybe some Disney products, do you think that it's, it's unfair that people would find a movie like the Willoughby's better for its animation than <laughs> the Lion King or vice versa? Because one's stylized and one isn't. Well, if you like the Willoughby's better then I think it's fair. If you, if you go the other <laughs> way, 
I think you don't know what you're talking about. You're wrong. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a, it's a big world, and I think there's a lot of stuff that gets made. And I think if we all listen to jazz, uh, then we'd all be the same. You know what I mean? Like, mm. the, the, it, it, you know, a huge hip hop song breaks out. You know, people don't say, you know, why is it more like, um, why isn't it more rock and roll? Like, you know what mm. I mean? Like, it's just pe- people like what they like. And I think in live action, you look at films and the diversity of tone, you know, from, you know, gritty action movies to like, you know, emotional dramas to broad comedies. I think animation is a film medium, so it should be able to travel all of those all of those swings. Um, so I think style in animation, for me, I, I don't, I'm not interested in real. Real is boring to me. And I, and I, I if I'm going to do real, I'd rather watch a documentary. I'd rather watch, you know, uh, um, you know, what Mike Judge does on Silicon Valley. Like that to me is, is different than King of the Hill. King of the Hill is stylized for a reason and it's sort of mm-hmm. part of the storytelling. But then, you know, if you did Silicon Valley in this King of the Hill style, it just wouldn't, wouldn't work. So I think you, you have to kind of figure out what the story wants and, and, and package it as such. I think for a movie like The Willoughby's, um, you know, if that was live action, I don't think the movie would be as funny. It just wouldn't be. I think the subject matter would be too heavy and it wouldn't, hmm. you'd have to, you'd have to skew it in a different direction. So I think the fact that it's an icon and the, the fact that it's, you know, a metaphor and the fact that it's like, you know, meant to be a parable, like a Roald doll story, like the fact that it's super stylized helps that, helps that kind of get over. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a storytelling decision to, to go that way. Um, I don't understand the Disney live action thing. But they uh, they find an audience and it makes people happy and I think you know for some movies it it definitely uh, it definitely works but um, I'm also an old man so I'm not their target demographic so I I am a I, I, I like to believe myself as a as a anim, as an animation man of a uh, man of culture I I, yes. I love the, I love the live action remakes as much as I love the as much as I yeah. love the originals or vice versa I mean at the end of the day it puts food on someone's table I guess I don't worry too much about it. And, and I think if the story's good and if, you know, John Favreau is an amazing director. So I think, you know, what he did with Jungle Book and, and Lion King, it, uh, it definitely makes people happy. So how can you fault it? You know, I do wish Aladdin was a bit more like Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels, but Guy Ritchie, <laughs> he's got to, you know, yeah. he's got to do what makes Disney happy at the end of the day. Yeah, there, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are boundaries there. I think. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, but when it comes to a film like The Willoughby's, you talk about how it couldn't be. Um, live action because the story might not work. I think there's also something to be said about the characters, uh, the the design of characters like the aunt or the you know uh, Mr. Marshmallow or even or even the kids. They don't work. Uh, they wouldn't work at, in such their inviting or um, it, or uh, translative states if they were live action. If they were just people in goofy costumes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, not to say that that somebody couldn't crack it. I, I think for for me as a storyteller, it 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 was it was it was, uh, it's the medium I love, like working with animation. So being able to boil those characters down and make those statements as cleanly as possible and, you know, kind of really, you know, treat that metaphor as a literal thing. Um, like Nanny is literally a walking hug, you know, Commander Melanoff is literally love wrapped up in, a, in, in, in you know, uh, um, you know, fancy packaging. Uh, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were literally trying to sort of like say that these are the characters' emotions and their design. And I think that was, um, that's, you can do it in live action, but it, it's definitely the thing that animation is good at. So we lean hard into it. And I also just realized I said, I said Mr. Marshmallow instead of Commander Mello. No, I <laughs> like that. And you said, you said uh, the ante instead of the, the nanny, too. So that's, uh, the, a, a disservice <laughs> to his military career. A disservice to his military career. Um, and, and when it comes to films like The Wilbies or uh, Cloudy, they have such fast paces. The, the jokes are a, a mile a minute and they're, they all hit. But how do you balance um, this, this fast paced, quick tone of comedy with the more solemn, emotional moments well i think that for the willies it was specifically because we were trying to do the sitcom meets a movie so um there's a rhythm to that kind of you know three camera dialogue that's you know 
I'd say it's kind of vaudevillian. Like it's definitely like that kind of rat-a-tat is, is what, what drives the storytelling. So we wanted to tap into that. And, um, you know, the process of figuring it out is really an editorial process. So it's, it's hours spent in edit- editorial with, um, you know, uh, Fiona and Ken, who were the, 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 the editors and just uh, pushing and pulling. And the, the hardest thing about being in that space is that, you know, you get used to the material. <laughs> So sometimes I'd cut it too hard, it'd be too tight, and then we'd have a screening, and then you'd figure out, oh, man, we, we went too tight on that. So then we have to loosen it back up. Um, uh, I don't know if you've had this with your school or whatever, like where you, you're working on something and you think you got it. And you, yes, I got it. And you go away for two days, and you look at it again with cold eyes, and it's like it doesn't, doesn't feel the same. So many times I'd have that thing where it's like, I, you know, you feel like you nailed it and edit, and then you bring in like nine people to look at it. And that reaction in that room is just like, oh, shit, we didn't get it. But you want to you want to get those out of you before you hit Rotten Tomatoes, before you hit, you know, your audience, because you can still fix stuff. You know, you're still in that space where you can make those adjustments. So um, that's the process. And, and I think it's I always say it's like slow motion stand up and it takes us a long time to, to, to hear if the punchline hits. Um, but for my process, I can't get it right without trial and error, without throwing it up and really auditioning the material. And so figuring out the sweet spot of how tight is too tight, how loose is too loose is really about, you know, that audience relationship and always trying to become the audience. I think that's one of the things that Miller and Lord do very well is they stand back from their material and they're really objective at key moments and are brave about their choices when they make changes. And so I learned that from those guys. Um, a, a good friend of mine and a former guest on the show, Mark Osborne directed. Oh, Mark's great. Yeah. Yeah, for Netflix. Uh, and this was back in a uh, year, which I totally remember. Uh, I think it was uh-huh. 2000, 2016. And yeah, this was the, the early, early days of distributing films through Netflix. Um, I remember w- him and I were talking and he didn't even know what, ne- uh, he, he didn't even believe that they could put a film on Netflix and see it um, be successful. And saying that now mm-hmm. just seems ludicrous. Um, with the uh, this the pandemic making people stay home and Trolls World Tour <laughs> single handedly destroying the entirety of the movie industry. Um, do you see the future of animation uh, turning more towards streaming, or do you see the future of uh, films turning more towards staying at home? I think it's been coming. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I do think um, I think the box office will come back. I think families will will crave that social communal experience of going to sit in a dark room and watch the movie. Uh, I definitely miss it myself. Yeah. Um, but I think I, here's what's really cool. Like, uh, if I look at the world we're in now, uh, there's a content explosion that has come from all these streaming services. And I think what it allows is, is just more diversity in the storytelling. Mm-hmm. Um, like if I think of the challenges we would have faced with a movie like The Willoughby's if we were trying to be a four quadrant, $100 million movie that was trying to make everybody happy, I don't think the movie would have been a better film. I don't think it would have served it well. So the fact that it comes into people's homes allows it to, I don't know, I think just be different. And I think the fact that the model now is a content driven model rather than a box office result model um, is, is, is creating a space for really interesting films. And I'm very excited to see what's coming um, down the line. And I think you know, uh, for me last year, it's like having, uh, I lost my body. Um, I don't know if you've seen that one. The, yeah, outstanding. Uh, the it's Netflix. outstanding. It, it was my favorite. And, and if I wasn't in a CIFA, like when I was an animation student, like finding those movies was, it was so hard. You know, you'd have to be in a big city where there was a screening or you'd have to, you know, have a friend who had a, a VHS or a beta or a laser disc. And then, you know, and, and I remember like finding Miyazaki when I was like in my mid twenties, because that stuff wasn't easy to find. Like, I love how this stuff is just out there and like the filmmakers can talk to an audience around the world. And I think it's really cool. Um, not only as somebody who gets to, you know, be part of making these things, but also as, a, as an audience, like yeah. there's, there's more interesting things. Like there, like animation is something I, I love making, but I don't always, you know, go out to watch. And sometimes it's because you can see the formula. And when I watch something that, you know, is so creative and original, like I lost my body, it's like, I don't see the formula. So these guys did a great job at sort of like telling me a story I didn't, I didn't expect. And that to me is why we watch movies. And so um, I'm excited for what that means for other filmmakers. Brilliant. Yeah. I think it's good. 
but I don't think, I don't think, I don't think there's one silver bullet, like having gone through the industry and watching the 2D studios rise up and then collapse and then the cable mm -hmm. industry rise up and then plateau. And now that's getting destroyed by the streaming industry and the CG houses rise up. Like it just, these are epochs and things come yeah. and go. And what, what ultimately has been the, the constant is that the audience continues to get bigger for what we are participating in like it just seems like people are more open to animation as you know whether it's through gaming or through marvel films or through this the traditional disney stuff there's a huge appetite for these kinds of stories so mm. um it's really cool it's really cool to be be able to play in that sandbox and do you ever get recommended the willoughby's on netflix no because i don't watch a lot of animations oh really <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i have to find it i think they know yeah, I think, they they know. I think the algorithm knows. Yeah. Brilliant. So, um, so Chris, it's been it's been outstanding to talk to you. Um, we're gonna have to wrap things up, but one thing that I always ask people before they sign off is if there is somebody out there listening to this interview, um, wowed by how smooth and sultry both of our voices are, <laughs> what would you tell them, um, if they were interested in getting into the animation industry? Um, I'd say focus on the base skills. Uh, at, you know, I think the technology is important and understanding how to use the technology is definitely a valuable in the career. But, um, you know, if you want to be an animator, learn how to act. If you want to be a storyteller, watch a lot of movies, read a lot, um, you know, uh, uh, create your own, like be a filmmaker. Don't, you don't have to wait till you have all those skills down to, to, to do the job and to kind of get those muscles going. Um, I think it's important to draw. It's important to act. It's, it's important to paint. It's important to do those, those base things that sort of create the underbelly of the art form. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, I think that's all. That's, that's the, the best advice I got when I was coming up, which was to draw a lot and, uh, yeah. and to, no matter what happens and where, where the industry goes, whether like the, you know, the features collapse and you end up in TV or you end up in commercials or end up doing music videos or video games, having one of those skills will help you, you know, survive in this industry because, you know, uh, a skill is a skill. So, learn Ladies those. and gentlemen, Chris Pern is the director of Cloudy with a Chance Meatballs 2 and the Willoughby's. And he is now streaming. That the whole internet crashed. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the Willoughby's, which is now streaming on Netflix. Uh, please go check it out. It is, it is fantastic. Chris, thank you so much for uh, joining me for this first episode of Cartoon vs. COVID. Um, do you have anything to say before we sign off this afternoon? Nope. Thank you so much. And I hope everybody stays healthy. And I hope, um, I hope this uh, brings awareness to the frontline workers and um, my hat goes off to them. And I just, uh, I really, um, I really hope people stay safe. So thank you. Everybody stay safe. Everybody stay home. Watch the Willoughby's and this episode multiple times. And if you would, are at all interested in donating to the cause, please check the links in the description below. Um, there'll be a link for the CDC network uh, donation page, as well as the Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center here in Manchester, New Hampshire. Um, thank everybody for watching. We will see you guys later. Goodbye. <laughs>